Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields on the program today. Steve Hubberman, a hobbyist optometrist. That means you play with people's eyes for oh, a living. Help people see. You help people see for 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 fun and fortune, yeah. and 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 to, you know, and, and, and for a modest uh, income, you know, right? Right. Yeah. Also, uh, Jason McPhee, California uh, State Government uh, Engineer. Welcome to the show. We're on uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento. We're on the web at www.accesssacramento.org, Channel 17, and we're uh, on YouTube as well as uh, Facebook uh, under Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, we would like to talk a little bit on this show about a couple of uh, bakers in Oregon who were fined $135,000 because they refused to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. I thought that was a case, wasn't there a, case, a previous case that went to the- In Colorado. Well, oh, that was Colorado. Right. So, the, the, but the, the Colorado case has not been decided yet. Right. right. Okay. And so, there's a similar case of a Muslim up in Michigan, so it's developing around the country. Okay. Well, this is a big, a big issue during the, uh, in, the, in the Gary Johnson campaign back in 2016. Uh, he uh, supported the, the laws that said that you had to, had to bake the cake for, uh, for gays or whoever, uh, and he was derided by purist libertarians by saying, bake a Nazi cake. Uh, which is totally analogous, actually. Uh, you know, that, that people, if they are open for business, have to do whatever the customer wants, essentially. Uh, how's this, how is this going to end up? We don't know. Well, it's going to be legislated. Well, it's going to be decided, yeah, in, the decided court. in the courts. It's going to be decided in the courts. All but the above our level down here in personal freedom. But if somebody bakes a cake, that one of the arguments is it's an artist. The, in Colorado, it was a master craft bakery that yeah. did it. In, Col yeah. in Oregon, it was a husband and wife that are now out of business. Well, because I mean, the, the argument is framed in the courts right. and in public opinion as the freedom of religion versus, or freedom, yeah, freedom of religion versus uh, gay rights. It's really not. It's really, a, 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 you know, the, the First Amendment perfect, uh, protects the free exercise of religion as well as a number of other uh, uh, issues, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, free exercise of religion. And you've got two problems with laws that say that a baker must bake a cake for a Nazi or for a gay or for whoever. And one of them is, is free exercise of religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But another one is freedom of association because you don't, you have, the freedom of association implies the freedom not to associate with people who are not of your liking for whatever reason. And if you are forced to bake a cake for somebody you don't like, don't want to associate with, you're being forced to associate with someone that you don't want to associate with. So there's a freedom of association issue as well as the free exercise of religion, as well as the freedom of speech. All, all of these uh, are, are uh, issues that, uh, that hopefully the Supreme Court will address in the uh, the uh, Colorado case, and then ultimately in the in the Oregon case. Well, it's too bad because you you, okay. were, I had him rotate the you, you you mentioned earlier um, that uh, how is this going to end? And one of the issues with how this is ending is for this particular bakery, they're out of business, and uh, I think they were facing a fine of one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars for for this um, essentially what should be a, a um, freedom of association issue for the most part. So. You know, it's funny too because I mean, I think most people see this as as some business and versus you know me the individual. But you know, in the end, in, in a market, we're all producers and we're all consumers. Uh, you know, we in, in order to unless we have some kind of distortion from the state, we all have to produce something in order to consume. And and so, imagine if if we as as consumers were told that. Uh, uh, every choice we made was going to be second guessed by the it's government. You know, if, if we chose not to go to McDonald's, well, maybe you, uh, you have to prove that it wasn't because of your dislike of the patriarchy and, and you know, Caucasians or something. Or, pl or clowns. <laughs> or clowns. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't, just, it's terrible to discriminate against clowns. Yes. <laughs> well, I, and the other issue here is I mean, libertarians were in favor of gay rights before it was cool. I mean, the first libertarian presidential candidate. John Hospers, back in 1972, was an openly gay man. 
and was nominated by the LP uh, with full knowledge that he was an openly gay man. And we've been in favor of gay marriage to the extent that marriage is a function of the state. We would argue that it shouldn't be a function of the state. It should be a, a totally private or religious ceremony, not, not you know, if you want to enforce the contract, that's fine, but there's no reason for government to write the terms a one-size-fits-all contract for everybody that gets married. That's, you know, that's uh, pretty anti-libertarian, but certainly there's no reason why the government should say that people uh, of uh, the same sex can't get married or people of the same or of different differing races, the misogyny laws yeah, can't get married. In fact, that's where the marriage laws came from. Uh, marriage was a private, a, a private sector uh, function until the misogyny laws after uh, during the Jim Crow era. Uh, there were no laws regulating marriage before that. Well, you know, it's funny too because the you know, a lot of times the free market, you know, people will see a business making this decision and they'll say, "Oh, a terrible free market." But it's in the, reality, the free market usually addresses this much faster than. Than, than government intervention. And one of the stories I think about is Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson was brought into baseball yeah. during the right, age of Jim Crow. Right. And it was because that, you know, baseball wasn't regulated for saying that you cannot have a, a, a black person playing. And so, you know, it, it was up to the free market. And um, uh, Branch Rickey, I think, was the guy's name. And he took a gamble. That was the uh, owner of the team that, uh, that took on Jackie Robinson. And, and he brought on Jackie Robinson, and sure enough, other teams saw, you know, what a difference that made when you had a, a high-caliber player like that come on. And so pretty soon, uh, lots of teams were taking black people on. And it's funny because by the time the Voting Rights Act came up, and I think it was 1965, baseball was already overrepresented with black people in the, from the population. They were, they were up to like, I think it was 15 percent, you know, was African American by the point that... Uh, the Voting Rights Act came into play, so the, well, yeah, the I mean that's extremely uh, lagging. What you're describing is the fact that culture comes first, law comes second. Sure. The culture changes, and then the law changes. It's not the other way around. The law doesn't change the culture, it's vice versa. But the market allowed it to happen. It well, yeah, the, mar the market right. is a reflection of the culture. Yes. Culture changes, people's attitudes change, that allows market decisions to follow the culture, and the politicians say, yeah, me too. And back to the free market, if the bakers don't want to take the money for the baking the cake, that's their choice whether they well, make the yeah, money or not. Well, yeah, and there's going to be plenty of, plenty right. of other bakers yes. that will yes, bake exactly. the cake. I mean, that's not going to be an issue. In fact, I understand in Australia, the bakers are jumping for joy. Now that there's gay marriage, there's going to be more ba wedding yeah, cakes more that they'll be able to sell. <laughs> this doubles your chance on right. a Saturday night, right? <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to another uh, case of Kafka-esque government regulation. This is a law that was newly passed I, I, in California, I believe, Yes. saying <laughs> that in order to sell ammunition, not guns, but ammunition, you have to have a license. So if you are not licensed, you can't sell uh, ammunition, but it's impossible to get a license. <laughs> am, I, am, I, am I understanding this correctly? Well, for a time there was. So this is uh, the funny thing. They, they apparently somebody in their wisdom decided that uh, uh, places that sell ammo, not guns, but ammo, needed to have a particular license from the state. And so this uh, passed in 2016 or, or 2017, sometime just, around there. It just went into effect. Yeah, and so it was supposed to come into effect at the beginning of this year, in, in January 1st. And so uh, the government had all that time, all these uh, uh, ammo shops uh, applied as they dut dutifully uh, for, their, for their permits to sell the ammo. And come January 1st, <laughs> none of the shops were given, it wasn't an uh, issue of of the government making choices between one and another. They just simply didn't give any of these permits out. And so uh, 131 Walmart stores uh, wound up uh, not being able to sell ammo on January 1st. So because they were selling, uh, uh, because they, they, they also required the permits apparently. And so, uh, but I guess there were many mom and pop stores that did wind up selling ammo uh, regardless, put in a, a situation of having to break the law even though they were trying to comply with the law. So. That was their. Have business. any of them been prosecuted by Jerry Two Brown and Company? Not as far as I know. Uh, they, but but they're uh, in danger of it, right? What they, they they could be. I mean, I suppose they could always come back and charge them. But uh, they did come through with the permits. I think uh, on the second or the third. I think. Oh, they, so, oh, so they finally did. They, get they the eventually permits. did, but it was just the idea that they, here they required this permit and they had a whole year to give it to. Yeah. Them. And whether they enforce that law or yeah. 
And there were a lot of sheriffs Charged too, with the local crime. sheriffs who yeah. were thinking, you know, well, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to enforce this because, you know, I know these guys, yes. they're trying to do everything right. And, you know, the government just isn't giving them what they're supposed to get. One of the other uh, problems with, uh, with uh, I, I'm going to call it uh, zoning laws and property rights regulations, is that if you want to open any kind of business, the ammo store is a good example, you have to have all kinds of licensing and permits. And uh, in case in point, uh, in, in Crocker Village, a gas station has had a, a bit of a problem. Tell us about that, uh, Jason. Well, this has uh, been a, a fairly long-running problem. I guess there's, there's been a development going on there. It's along uh, near Sac City College, and so there's this uh, rail yard that had been undeveloped for years, and so uh, they decided to do this development under um, a developer, Petrovich, and uh, they had uh, projected to have a shopping center in the heart of this uh, development. And uh, so they started building the houses, and at some point they decided, okay, let's put a gas station in there, and suddenly, uh, you know, a few of the residents decided, uh, pr prior residents of Curtis Park decided they didn't like having a 16-pump uh, gas station coming in. And so, <clears throat> but uh, one of the tenants come in, that they were trying to get in a Safeway store, uh, that was part of the deal. If Safeway was going to come, they wanted to have a 16-pump station there. And so uh, some of the uh, residents of Curtis Park got together with one of the local city councilmen and, and did just about everything they could to block having this gas station there. And, uh, and it's, it went back and forth. This was around 2015 where this controversy started up. And so uh, Petrovich then started threatening to, to if, if they lost the Safeway, then, well, we'll, we'll invite, uh, um, you know, some pawn shops grocery and outlet. <laughs> a <Yes>. grocery outlet <laughs> and uh and they even made a video i, I think uh showing a uh, demonstration of, of what the community would look like with those <laughs> buildings in there and so just uh recently so it's been going back and forth for about two years and now just recently uh, a judge threw out the decision of the city council to block the gas station because uh they said that there was uh undue animosity i guess between City Councilman Chenier and uh, the uh, uh, Petrovich, and so uh, there's... But nothing in there about the property rights of uh, uh, Petrovich to build a gas station where it's properly zoned and so forth. Personalities, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, that's where it gets right down to it. I mean, I, I, how, how much say should uh, people who, uh, you know, who live nearby somebody else's property have about what they do with their own property? And, if you don't like what your neighbor is doing with their property, buy it. Sure. And do whatever you want with it. Sure. But don't tell your neighbor they can't do what they want to sure. with their property, assuming it's not a nuisance. And I mean, I can understand if you had some kind of a community where they had a homeowners association or something, then you've got a prior contract. But in this case, I, I'm not sure that that's at all the case. <laughs> Unless you think you've got some influence on city council. There you go, yes. yeah. <laughs> and just want to use government try to muscle right. your, yes. your yes. view of things. Yeah. Since we're talking about gasoline, I understand that uh, in Oregon, uh, oh. up until very recently, you could not pump your own gas. You had to pay a, a 1950s style gas jockey to fill your car up with gas. Yeah. But that changed. The, the, the reason for it, behind the ban, is they don't want pregnant women smelling the gas. They don't want to get gas on your hands. There's other reasons. There's danger of uh, gas getting on the ground and slipping and falling. But they have permitted now, out in small communities, they can have a few gas stations where you can pump your own. But the big cities still are under the, the ban. It, it's now, is this a like make-work job for, gas, for, oh, for, right. for teenagers being gas jockeys or what? They can start with low pay, yes. <laughs> Give no, them I'm something seriously. to do. We, we've been pumping our own gas. I mean, I, when I was growing up, there were gas jockeys that would run out there and wash your windshield and check your oil and check the air in your tires and fill your gas tank and, you know, you know full-service gas station that did the whole thing. But it was not required that gas stations do that. It was just a service they provided. Eventually, people decided they would rather pay a few cents less for a gallon of gas than uh, have all of those services, and so gradually full service one. And you notice how much service. less you're paying for your gas since you're not paying a gas attendant? Well, our see, gas prices yeah. are going up. Well, they've gone up anyway. Even without but, them. 
but, but still, but you're still paying. I mean, the, the, there's a, still a few full service stations left, and you pay 20, 30 cents a gallon more, you know, for you know for that service. Most people decided they don't want to pay for that service, and so they'll pump themselves. And that's what's happening. Well, I guess that's starting to happen uh, to a certain extent in Oregon. But what's the blowback? What, what, are, what are we hearing from uh, from the uh, people who have never, ever had to pump their own gas? Uh, and, and, and this is the sad thing. I mean, when you have people who've, I guess, been infantilized by government, while the rest of us have been allowed to, to take responsibility for, for this, um, you know, high qualified, highly qualified job of taking a nozzle and moving it from five, you know, three feet from, from a mechanism into the hole in your car <laughs> in order to put the, the gasoline in. I, you know, these people, it's, it's absolutely hysterical. Some of the quotes that have been documented, I think, in a Forbes article and uh, many other places on the Internet. Uh, one, one constituent says, many people are not capable of knowing how to pump gas and the hazards of not doing it correctly. Besides, I don't want to go to work smelling of gas when I get it on my hands or clothes. I agree, very bad idea. Another says, I don't even know how to pump gas and I am 62, a native or Oregonian. I say, no thanks, I don't want to smell like gasoline. <laughs> there, there's even one more, it says, I lived in this state all my life and I refuse to pump my own gas. I had to do it once in California while visiting my brother, and I almost died doing it. <laughs> Those California killer gas stations yes. are on the loose once again. Yes. Okay, Dreaded. well, maybe, maybe, maybe they will eventually grow up in Oregon. We'll see. I'm not sure, though. Um, okay. The House passed last week a bill extending Section 702 of uh, FISA, uh, Federal or the Foreign Intelligence, whatever it is, the, the spying operation uh, uh, managed by NSA. Now, just a little bit of background. Uh, back uh, in 2013, I think it was, Edward Snowden, the famous whistleblower, worked for, uh, for uh, a, a defense or an intelligence contractor. He laid out the fact, fact that the NSA, through its various arms, was essentially uh, listening in to every phone conversation, watching every text message, uh, reading every email, or at least had access to do those things. Everything that went on electronically over the net or over phone lines was fair game for the NSA to uh, eavesdrop on or, 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 or look at or, or, or watch. People were outraged, rightfully so, because it's a you know it's a tremendous violation of privacy. It's a in total contravention to the Fourth Amendment, which says you have to have a warrant if you want to search people's uh, property, search people's things. Um, but uh, shortly after that, the, uh, the the FISA was amended with Section 702 to say that well we're going to let you do it if there is. If, if one of the parties to this particular uh, conversation or text message or whatever is a foreigner, because foreigners don't have Fourth Amendment protection. Americans do, foreigners don't. So if a foreigner, you know, if, 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 the, if the federal intelligence agencies want to spy on a foreigner, that's okay. If it's an American on the other end of the conversation, tough luck. That's what the law was. It was set to expire December 31st. 2017. Last week, the House of Representatives voted with uh, Democrat and Republican votes to extend the uh, FISA deadline to, uh, for another six years. And just today, the U.S. Senate, Thursday uh, the 18th, a day that will live in inf infamy, the Senate agreed to uh, the House provision and ratified another six years of warrantless searches on Americans, email, text messages, phone conversations, you name it, uh, without a warrant. Well, one of the, the sad things about this is how are you going to determine, I guess, uh, uh, who's a foreigner? Does that mean that the law enforcement is going to, to essentially be tracking every foreigner so that they can listen in on as much as possible? I, it just seems uh, you know rather odd to have this type of a sort of an open-ended thing. I mean, if they were if they were already spying on so many Americans before this 702, it, it seems like it would just be open season, I guess, on, on spying on foreigners. <laughs> and then I guess 
Well, it's open season on, on essentially everybody because sure. they're, they're, what they're doing is they're saying we don't need we don't need no damn warrant. Uh, we're going to listen in on whatever who, whoever <laughs> we feel like listening in on with the fig leaf uh, proviso that one of the one of the parties to the conversation is uh, is uh, not a U.S. citizen. So that essentially allows us to listen to in, into anything that crosses the national border. That means that Facebook is compromised. It means that Gmail, Google is compromised. It means that uh, the uh, the uh, telecom carriers, AT and T, and so forth, they're compromised. All of them are essentially turned into uh, uh, aiding and abetting uh, the NSA and other uh, spy agencies to find out what people are talking about. So it's a loophole for the eye of Big Brother, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're living in a George Orwell 1984 world. Uh, the only thing that's missing is the, the imprisonment. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, the, well, even that. We've got even a camcorder. That, there's a camera on yes. your, yeah. some people are putting a, a piece of uh, tape over the uh, camera on their uh, PC. And Steve Jobs put the tape over his? Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, people in the know are doing that. Uh, okay. So that's 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 that issue. Uh, another issue is uh, the coal memo rescission by Jeff Sessions. Tell us about how that will affect the uh, legality of marijuana in the uh, several states that have legalized both medical and uh, recreational marijuana. The coal, the coal memo. Uh, under the Obama administration, uh, an assistant. Uh, uh, attorney at the Department of Justice wrote a memo saying that we will not prosecute yes. people who buy and sell marijuana in states where it is legal, like California, like Colorado, like Washington State. Those states, we're going to put it at the very bottom of our priority list, which means that essentially there will be no enforcement of the federal marijuana laws, which classify marijuana as a Schedule One drug. In other words, it's more dangerous or as dangerous as heroin and fentanyl and, and all of the uh, other drugs that are on Schedule One, which means no medical use, which is nonsense, and dangerous, which is also pretty much nonsense. So Jeff Sessions, an unreconstructed drug warrior in the Nixon Agnew mold, has said, good people don't smoke marijuana. And therefore, I'm rescinding the coal memorandum. I am saying to federal uh, marshals, federal uh, uh, Justice Department, uh, federal attorneys uh, all over the country, use your discretion. Go after people who use uh, marijuana at, at will. Well, the sad thing is I, I believe that Trump, during while he was running, uh, I, I think when he was asked about this, I think he said it was a states' rights issue. Many times. Yes, and so now uh, to be going back on this, it's you know, there's it's funny. There's some libertarians who seem to be lauding Trump because he's cutting a lot of regulation, but on the other hand, you know, it's it seems to be somewhat unprincipled because here we have a you know sort of a reinvigorating the drug war. It almost appears. So I, I hope that's not where we're going. Well, that, that's exactly where Sessions is taking us. Yes. Now the question, of course, is whether or not that's going to whether or not Really, the ultimate question right now is whether or not Congress will have the intestinal fortitude to agree with 64% of the public who thinks marijuana should be legalized for recreational use. A majority of Republicans think marijuana should be legal. Uh, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of courage to take marijuana off of Schedule One. It does take a, a certain amount of uh, courage to remove that source of revenue for civil asset forfeiture because that's what it's being used for. The illegality of cannabis is a great reason for drug sniffing dogs to stop whoever they damn well please on federal highways and confiscate cars, confiscate drugs, confiscate homes uh, because a drug sniffing dog or uh, a search turns up marijuana which is illegal at the federal level. Uh, civil asset forfeiture, another huge problem in this country. As you said, culture has to change before we change the, the law. The culture has changed. It, the culture has, has done changed. Now we're I mean, waiting those, on the law. Yeah, changed. now we, we, we're, we're waiting on our congressmen to finally get the message, to finally read Gallup, to finally figure out that their constituents are saying, hey, change the law. This is like prohibition during the 1920s. 
It's ridiculous. They're busy not deciding about our, our budget. Yeah. They're doing, yeah, no fighting true. that for some reason. Well, hopefully this is where we as libertarians can, can really take a stand and, and help people to realize as a teaching moment that you, know, you have sovereignty over your body. What you put into your own body is, is your choice, especially if you're not harming anybody else. So, and I think this, this is a type of message that hopefully will, will resonate with young people and, and maybe we'll be able to, to open up more people's minds to ideas about liberty. Another scarlet letter for the Trump administration is the deportation of aliens. And one of the most egregious examples of that is the case of the El Salvadorans. Uh, the Salvadorans came here as a result of an earthquake in El Salvador uh, some, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, as well as uh, fleeing from a despotic government. They've been here not on the welfare rolls, but earning a living, earning an honest living, have a, having a like a 90, 95% employment uh, participation rate compared to a 60-something employment participation rate for Native Americans. In other words, they work a hell of a lot harder than, than most of the rest of Americans do. They have been here for 20 years, uh, a couple hundred thousand of them, and they have over 100,000 kids who were born in this country. And now the Trump ICE is talking about deporting them in 18 months. He's saying, you know, the, the, the earthquake happened a long time ago. Go back. Go back home. There's no reason for you to be here anymore. Comments? I think they're going to have to pay for it in one way or the other. The government has to pay for the, them going back, I would say. We're not going to just take them to the border, I believe. No, they'll put them on planes and say uh, adios. Uh, and if you and, and the, the the administration has have, has the gall to say when asked, yeah. what about the children? Well, we're not going to get involved in personal family decisions. Mm -hmm. So in other words, parents who it's have underage kids that are American citizens will have to f make a decision whether to take their kids who can't speak Spanish probably uh, back to uh, a, a pover an impoverished country in Central America against their their will against the kids' will. And uh, it's, you know, it's uh, an, an egregious example of how we are kicking out people who are productive citizens of the, of the country and for no good reason other than to fulfill the nativist campaign promises of uh, a president who ran on that particular issue. That's the show. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint on the web at uh, www.accesssacramento.org, channel 17, cable channel 17 in Sacramento, YouTube, and on, the, uh, and on Facebook, Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much for being part of the show. See you next week.